So fun background story, literally right before all this happened, um, before we just went live, we found out that a tree decided to fall down and land on some power lines and take out, I don't know, 1,500 people in the downtown market. So yeah, I'm sweating. Look at that. So we're going to have to close up for tonight, and that's a bummer. But for those lucky people that uh, decided to, uh, that decided to uh, get some kits tonight, we're still going to cook some chicken. So we're going to go to my happy place. I need a break from reality, and cooking does that. So I definitely think that's what we're going to do. So how's everybody been? How's your week been? You been good? been a crazy, crazy week for us, opening two restaurants and not closing a restaurant, <laughs> all the above. But yeah, we're going to have some fun tonight, so I'm just washing my hands, getting ready. I was having some technical difficulties trying to get that camera working. Didn't want to work with me. All right. So let's get into this kit and see what we got. This is like a mystery basket. I feel like I'm on chops. <laughs> you wrote the menu. Come Open on. your baskets. <laughs> you know, that's actually a real fu funny story, uh, T. Um, when I worked in Chicago, I hosted Curtis uh, Stone for an event. And they were like, yeah, he's going to do a mystery basket. And I was like, oh, I'm going to mess this guy up and give him the hardest basket ever. And then his people called me like, or they emailed us like the next day. And they were like, here's what Curtis Stone would like in his refrigerator. So we like had to stock it to his recipes. And then he comes in, you know, all 6'5", Australian. And he's like, oh, let's see what Chef gave me. Oh, there's some shrimp. I think I'm going to make some scampi. <laughs> really? Yeah, it was your grocery list. <laughs> yeah, it was, <laughs> it was his grocery list. Yeah, Magic of TV. All right. So we got three bags here. One of them I'm looking for right now is a drink. That's, <laughs> that's definitely what I want. What kind of drink we have? We're doing a Paloma tonight. So we have a uh, grapefruit, citrus, tequila mixture in your core container. And then we have some club soda to top it off. You only need about two ounces uh, to the six ounces of liquid uh, to make your cocktail over ice. So she's going to make a cocktail with that. Oh, I was going to take that trash bag, but okay, I'll make the cocktail. Yeah. Again. Well, then let's see if you make it, actually. Okay. I'll get you some ice, though. How about let's that? see. We've got some carrots, some really pretty rainbow carrots. Um, gorgeous. I'm going to show you guys how to, how to work with these tonight. Um, we definitely have a chicken. That's important. we got a nice whole chicken, so we're good there. We'll put that to the side for right now. I don't want to get that raw chicken on my cutting board. We've got two things of chicken stock. So one of those uh, chicken stock containers is going to be for the lentils. The other one's going to be for the sauce. Then we have some lentils. You know, when, when T and I were talking about um, what kind of class, uh, she had recently asked me, like, you know, what's a lentil? Um, we were talking about some, some high you know, high protein and, and <laughs> different types of legumes and grains. And uh, she asked me what's a lentil. So. Uh, we thought, you know, that would be something perfect. So we have these black beluga lentils that we're going to cook tonight. Um, I want to clarify. I said, ew, lentils. And then you said, no, <laughs> lentils can be great. I'll, I'll show you how to make them tasty. Yeah. That's kind of well, that, how that happened. Okay. That's fair. That's kind of how that happened. I don't know if they can hear me when you're on your pods, but. <laughs> I think so. Okay, good. Uh, we got tons of herb. Not that kind of herb. Stop it. I know we're in Colorado, but not that kind of herb. Uh, there's some 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 twine in there as well that chef cut for us. So we're going to use this to tie up our chicken. And then you've got some salt, pepper, and garlic in this first kit. So that's good. My paper got wet. Oh, here's ice. Sweet. I don't know if that's enough ice, but it was taking a while. All right. I spilled water all over my recipe. So it's a good thing I know it. All right, second kit has all kinds of other ingredients. So they're labeled. Yay! Good Shout day. out to the four team. We love you guys. They're amazing. Um, Mirepoix. Uh, this was something that uh, 
my it was actually funny. My auntie actually hit me up. And she was like, I don't even know how to pronounce that. What is that? A mirepoix is just a French term for uh, celery, carrot, onion. This is the base for for most uh, soup sauces. Uh, we're gonna use this to work into our lentils, impart a lot of flavors. We've got some oil. We've got some butter. We've got some wine. We've got some chopped garlic. We've got some more wine. We've got some honey. We've got some more wine. My, mine says wino. <laughs> I think they're trying to tell me something. All right, so I'm unpacking all that stuff, and uh, we're going to get started. So uh, let's preheat our ovens. That's the first part, because the chicken's going to take the longest. We always talk about uh, cooking in these classes and thinking about what's going to take the longest, what's going to pop up, uh, and then how does it all come together. Uh, the chicken is going to take a good hour maybe an hour, 15 minutes, um, depending on your oven, but uh, we're gonna turn that up high right now. So I want you to turn your oven up to 425. Let's get that oven hot. We're gonna start high, then we're gonna drop low. Don't forget Sweet. the drink. Hi, hi. So I'm gonna go on convection. Uh, we're gonna go 425. If you're working with a conventional oven, 450. Um, That'll be the temperature that we'll work with. As far as this cocktail, I'm just gonna pour it over some ice and top it with some soda, because that's where I'm at right now. So that's how you make it too, right? That's like how that? you make it too. Okay. <laughs> uh, if you need a shot, I'll pour you one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so over 2020. This has been the most therapeutic thing is hanging out with you guys on Saturday nights and doing these. So thanks for joining us, because we're enjoying these and we look forward to them. All right. so. Cocktail, ice, right over the top. I don't need one, so you go for it. You don't need one? No. I'm drink this whole thing. It's going to be a real Julia, Julia Child kind of night. You saw that? It exploded. We can't make it up anymore. Gonna... All right. Hopefully, I don't burn down the kitchen tonight. <laughs> <Not funny. laughs> All right. So I'm just going to top that with about two ounces. Of soda in there just to give it some effervescence. You like that word? It's my word of the day. I mean, you've said a lot. <laughs> I, yeah, I used it last night too. Effervescence. Man, we had such a good meal for last night. It was, it was so delicious. The team killed it. I'm just gonna stir that up real quick. Cheers, everybody. That's a good diploma. <laughs> All right. So, chicken's gonna take the longest. We're, we're preheating our chicken at this point and, um, Say the, say the two temps again for the ovens, just to make sure. Yep, we're gonna start at 425 with conventional, uh, excuse me, with convection, 450 if you have conventional. So conventional, meaning no fan, uh, convection, meaning with the fan, the air circulates. So I would say there's about a 25 degree uh, difference between the two uh, when you're using it. Uh, the conventional having to be a little bit higher because it doesn't have the, the heat circulating around the oven. Uh, I'm going to clear up my cutting board right now, get all these ingredients to the side, because we're going to focus on the chicken. The chicken's the most important part, and this is, this is the life skill I'm, I'm going to teach you tonight, because this goes so much further than just cooking a chicken on, on Saturday night. This is something you can apply to Thanksgiving, right? It's my favorite holiday. I don't know if it's really a holiday, but it's my favorite day to cook, um, because it's a, it's a day about food and, and paying homage to food. And uh, roasting turkey is one of my favorite things. But the principles we're going to talk about tonight, as far as this, uh, this chicken, um, you can apply to the, to the turkey. So we've got the chicken. I'm just going to take out the bag. Okay. Uh -huh. now, the first part, I'm working in the sink when it, when it comes to this chicken. Okay. The first part um, to remember is cross-contamination. I think we have to talk about that. Most cases of, of, uh, of food poisoning actually happen at home because most people don't understand cross-contamination. And that is when you have raw meat touch a, a ready-to-work area. Um, we're going to have food that's going to be ready to eat. So you want to make sure that that's staying away from uh, your workstation um, or you're thoroughly sanitizing your board, you're cleaning your board, hot water, soap, uh, making sure you're scrubbing that down. So um, I'm going to work on this large cutting board that I have here. 
Uh, but first, I'm going to actually rinse the chicken. You know, it's just a habit. Make sure to... chickens get packed. You want to just make sure you rinse off any of that excess, um, you know. Uh, Packing material? Pack, yeah, all that, all that stuff in there. So I think that's one of the first parts is make sure you rinse the chicken. So you're actually filling the middle up with water and like just letting it run all the way through? Yeah, there. so I'm, I'm, pouring, I'm pouring water through the actual chicken. Um, through the cavity, making sure I get all of that rinsed out <laughs> all the way through. Did I lose it? There we go. <laughs> I was trying to be helpful. And yep. that's so, what I'm also looking for with this chicken is I'm also making sure it's not slimy. That's one of the things I'm looking for. Now, this is a beautiful chicken. It's the right size. It's not a steroid chicken where they're like, oh, it's all natural. This is actually a really nice chicken. So, um, I'm just going to shake that water off. And I'm going to work right on this cutting board. Okay, so help me help you. Right now, this uh, this chicken, Tina's like the perfect. I'm trying, guys. No, you're a rock star. <laughs> so now now the chicken's just kind of sprawled out. It's uh, you know, it's it's everywhere. It's got the it's got the Swedish chef look to it right now. Um, what we're gonna want to do is we're gonna we want to eliminate that surface area. That's that's a really important part. That all that extra area um, that's just kind of loose right now. It's it's what's gonna allow the chicken to um, cook unevenly. So we don't want that. We want to be able to make the chicken nice and compact, right? We want to get it all into one ball, one shape, one size, um, and that's a that's a key piece for us. So. Oh, sorry. Very good. <laughs> can you talk about what kind of pan they're going to need just so they can get prepared for that? Absolutely. So um, if you have a cookie tray, um, that's definitely going to be the easiest to work with. Um, I'm going to roast mine uh, just in this cast iron pan, this big pan. You know, it's got pretty, pretty small edges, so the air is able to get in there and circulate around it. So um, that's the pan that I'm going to roast this chicken in, but that's where we'll start. If you're working with a cookie sh uh, or a sheet tray or cookie tray, um, uh, that's fine as well. You know, you just want something that the bird can sit on. So the next part that I think is extremely important is uh, take paper towel and dry the chicken, right? Water creates a, uh, a lot of steam. We don't want steam. Steam is the enemy when we're roasting a chicken. You know, I taught a class back on Thanksgiving about um, blow drying a chicken or a turkey. Turkey. Yeah, and it, and it was serious. I forgot who I got that from, but it was a uh, oh, it was a uh, it was it was a uh, Kelsey from Top Chef Kentucky. Um, I thought that was such a cool technique because one of the tricks we do in the restaurant to make sure that the the skin gets extra crispy is we actually uh, leave the bird in the cooler uncovered. Uh, and we allow the, the fan and the walk-in to circulate air around it. So it actually dries the skin out um, before we put it in the oven. But, you know, what we're going to do is we're just going to pat this, this bird dry as much as we can. So, you know, take that paper towel and, and really just try to get that bird completely dry. And you'll feel the water contents gone on it. Um, but that's a really, really important part because that's what's going to give us a nice crispy skin. You'll see this technique being done uh, even in, uh, when, when you make Peking duck. That's another, another classic uh, crispy skin type method, but it is about getting that skin nice and dry. And, um, that's what we're doing. So we're gonna dry this bird down. You know, don't be afraid to put that paper towel inside the cavity. Chicken's gross to you I'm out. so grossed out right now. <laughs> <laughs> I knew she was grossed out. Um, it's just like, what are you doing to that chicken? <laughs> she feels like I'm violating this bird. <laughs> but we're actually just really trying to get the water content out of there as much as possible um, because we don't want steam. Steam is bad. And you got to think, there's a lot of good fat content in the skin. So, you know, that's going to render as we cook this bird. That little guy has a broken leg. I know he does have a broken arm. The arm. We're going to tie him up so he'll be fine. It's like a suture. All right. Not going there. <laughs> so the bird now is dry. Okay. He's good. He's good. Nice and dry all the way through. 
what we're going to do is um, we're going to tie this bird up. So I'm going to wash my hands so I can grab some of the product from the other. And this is where I keep talking about, you know, um, cross contamination. Make sure you're working on an area that is completely away from your, your ingredients so you don't mix them up with the raw and the cooked. Uh, and then make sure you wash your hands a lot. I mean, I think we're all in the habit at this point now of washing our hands way more than everyone used to, which is Not a great thing. People. You guys always wash yeah, your hands. Kitchen, kitchen people are pretty good. Medical professionals, I think we're, we're pretty much trained that way. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to grab that string. And that string is an important part. But the one thing you have to consider on this bird right now is the center has all of this this open air, right? The cavity, there's there's nothing in there. So that's something that you wanna think about right now. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this bouquet of herbs that Chef gave us, right? And we're actually gonna stuff the cavity with those herbs. This is gonna fill up the this is going to fill up the cavity and it's pretty cool because some of this some of this stuff is actually we grew you know all that sage that you're smelling in there uh that really potent smell of thanksgiving that came from our garden at four we have this giant bush that came back um so you've got some thyme in there you've got parsley in here uh that's going to be the filling for our birds that's actually the cavity so we're going to stuff that in there was that all of the herbs that were in the box yep that was all the herbs that were in the box so we're going to take that entire bouquet of herbs and I'm going to shove it right into the cavity of the bird. <laughs> it's like a little flower pot now. So now you should have this really pretty flower pot of herbs In inside chicken. your chicken. <laughs> I know it sounds weird. This is how chefs like have senses of humor, but I'm just stuffing the herbs into that cavity. This is going to give your chicken tons of flavor profiles because they're gonna bake into the chicken, right? Herbs release oils when they cook and, and that's gonna breathe into that breast, that's gonna breathe into those thighs, it's gonna breathe into everywhere. But it's also filling up this dead space of, of uh, open cavity, right? Because air can get in there and, and um, cook your chicken unevenly. So that's one of the things we're trying to avoid. So it's like twofold, you get flavor and it protects the. Absolutely. Okay. So if you've got, you know, an herb garden outside and you got tons of sage right now, or rosemary or parsley, chives, that's a great way to utilize these is just stuff them in there, fill up that cavity because you're going to get lots of flavor. Wash your hands again. All right. So I'm washing my hands again because I need to grab the salt and the pepper. That's what we're going to do next. And we're going to season the bird. I'm a very almost purist when it comes to how to roast a chicken. I, I don't think you need a lot. You know, I, I think when it comes to turkey, you know, I brine, uh, which you could brine this bird as well. That's a whole other class. We're not gonna get into that today. We're gonna keep it simple. But um, salt, pepper, and herbs for me is, is key. I, I, I really, really think you don't need much more than that. I think a, a chicken is, is delicious when you keep it that simple. So I'm gonna grab the salt and the pepper. We got some toasted black pepper that Chef gave us, and we've got some kosher salt. They're both labeled, which is awesome. And we're gonna season this bird. So we're gonna sprinkle the salt from up top. We're gonna let that salt rain on the bird all the way through. Should you always use fresh herbs in the cavity? Sorry. Yeah, so fresh herbs are nice because fresh herbs are alive. They're they're, 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 they've got structure to them versus dried herbs. You could use dried herbs. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, the problem is they've been dehydrated. So they lost a lot of that, that water content that's in there and those oils that are in there. They're not as fragrant. Um, but yeah, fresh herbs, definitely the way to go. Another thing you could actually do in here is just stuff it with some onions and garlic and celery and carrots. Um, that would be another one, the mirepoix we talked about. Okay, so the salt I'm gonna take and I'm literally gonna rain it from the top so I can get it all over the outside of this bird. And right now the bird is sitting um, with its breast up and its back to the cutting board. So I'm just seasoning the top portion of the bird at this point. And I'm going a little heavy because one thing salt does is 
it actually helps dry out the skin as well. Um, it, when you're making chicken wings, uh, it's a great thing to use a salt in your rub um, and even add things like cornstarch or baking soda uh, because it's gonna actually help with, the, with drying out the wings. Hey, so as a recap real quick. Pepper too. Sorry. If you have a convection oven, you're on four. 25. And if you have a conventional oven. 450, a little bit higher. And all we've done so far is rinse that chicken off, uh -huh. dry it off with paper towels. Yep. And stuff it with the herbs that came in the box. Yep. And now we're seasoning it with salt and pepper. Yep. Don't cross contaminate. Wash your hands often. We had a couple late comers, so I'm just trying to Tina's get Tina's hired. <laughs> she's hired. I'm trying to catch she, him up. <laughs> she always tells me, but she's like, oh, I don't cook. But she actually knows a lot about cooking. It's, <laughs> it's, it's mind blowing. You know, she surprises me a lot of the times. Okay, so I'm going to flip the bird over now. I've seasoned heavily the top portion. So I've got all that salt and pepper nicely coated on that side. I want to make sure I season evenly. So you're going to flip it over to now the breast side is on the bottom, and we're going to season the back. So you're not going to reuse that salt now because you touched the chicken and the salt, right? Correct. Okay. And I, I know that you guys can't see the bird, but hopefully when he picks it up and you're seasoning it, it's not a lot to watch, but <laughs> salt, pepper, go. Yeah. So we're seasoning both sides <laughs> we're of, the, raining it. of the bird. We're, we're sprinkling it heavily from the top. We're raining it onto the bird. All right. So now I've got both sides of my chicken. Now this is where I'm going to ask Tina to position the phone over or the camera over my cutting board so you can watch me tie it. But what you're going to need now is your string. All right, hold please, because there's a little bit of a delay, and I got to see if I can see you and they can see me. All Not right, me, but my camera view. So you're going to need to tilt down just a little bit more, a little bit more. And it's come a little bit closer to, towards me. Like, oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm still moving the camera. That may not be good. Oh, okay. That looks. Yeah, okay, you move. Cool. There we go. I think everyone can see that. Okay. So I've got the legs right here. And this is a key piece because the string I've laid out directly on the bottom. What you're going to do is do a figure eight around the legs. So essentially, I've got both legs that I'm going to cross into a figure eight. Whoa, whoa, that's cool. Did you guys see that? I'm gonna go back and redo it. Good. Okay. So you have the string. I'm gonna take the string. I'm going to put the right side of the string, and it's about even on both sides. I'm gonna put the right side of the string under the leg, right under that knuckle. I'm gonna put it right there. I'm gonna take this left part of the string. I'm gonna go over the knuckle and I'm gonna come under it. So at this point, I now have a hook on this side of the, ch of, the, of the chicken leg, and this side I'm going to bring over to my other hand. So now I have a cross, and I'm going to pull the legs together. What you're gonna see happen is the legs need to go, one needs to go above the other. So you can see this part of the knuckle is above this one. That is now giving me a really tight lock on both of those, those legs. You now have about equal parts of string left in each hand. You're gonna come around the thighs right here and you're gonna tuck, you're gonna come on the wings on this side and you're gonna tie it right here at the neck. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the string, I'm still holding it in that position that I originally had it in, I'm gonna wrap the string around the bottom of the thighs, and I'm gonna go over the wings, and I'm going to tie it in a knot at the neck. Oh, that string was just long enough, huh? Yep. So when I get to this point. You gotta be, you're pulling it pretty tight, right? Yeah, and you're gonna tie it tight, because the goal is we don't want the chicken to be floppy. We want it to be compact. So it's really hard to do slow. Uh, so I'm going to tie that into a knot right at the top of the bird. Can't see it. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. We'll give everybody time. Make sure that they have questions. Yep. So far, they don't. Have, I think they're all 
They all got chicken hands. I don't Everyone's got chicken this. hands. Okay. <laughs> so as my bird is tied up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure my wings are tucked. So the wing tip, I can tuck right into that between the breast and the, and the leg on both sides. This one I had a broken leg, so. That guy was busted. Poor guy. <laughs> so I'm going to tuck this one as well in there. Awesome. And at this point, I've got a bird that has the breast position nice and tight up top. The legs are compacted. Um, they're locked down. The thighs are, it's, it's all in one spot. And then I don't have any open area uh, where air can really get in and lose me as far as um, you know, cooking this chicken unevenly. Somebody asked why, what's the reasoning for not using any oil? You just salt and pepper so far. Because there's fat content in this bird. And um, I'm not trying to fry this skin. I want to dry this skin out. So I want the heat to actually do its job, cook the rest of the moisture out. And this is why we start high and then we drop low. Um, so that's a key piece for me of why. Well, if they had a broken chicken arm, at least they'll know how to tuck it in. Yeah. Like ours was a little bit broken. Okay. So at this point now, I can take my bird and I can actually throw it right into my roasting pan. So good to go. This is where you could put something underneath of it if you wanted to. Um, for me, this I'm not worried about that because I'm going to turn this into a sauce. And this is why I'm using this pan because I want the drippings um, later. I'm going to show you how to get all the flavors off of this so we can be able to um, And even if you had a cookie sheet, you, you also go get the flavor. Yeah, it, yeah. So it works okay. on the cookie sheet as well. Okay. okay. So I'm going to wash my hands one more time before I throw this in the oven because I don't want to touch the oven. Thank you. Um, so while, while you're washing your hands, how's everybody's... Uh, Trust bird. Is yes, that, that trust. is the right term. Check you out. The trust bird. The trust the bird. Um, also, I'm just going to say it. A lot of people read Fifty Shades of Grey. And if you don't know, there's a funny book called The Fifty Shades of Chicken. <laughs> it's a recipe book, and it's kind of written in the tone of that book. And I suggest you read it because it's hilarious. I said it. Whatever. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, we have a lot of kid fans, so well, I wasn't going to bring that up. I didn't say anything inappropriate. <laughs> I just said a name, 50 Shades of Chicken. <laughs> 50 Shades of chicken. chicken. So our chicken is tied up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See, now you're blushing. <laughs> <laughs> I am blushing. All right. So I'm going to put this right into the oven. What about, is there any um, garlic that's supposed to be on this? Um, uh, what about the garlic that's on the chicken list? Oh. Well, we brother took out his menu, so hold on. We might have, we might need garlic. <laughs> good catch. All right. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, good job, Susan. All right, Susan, take that garlic and you can just stuff it into that bird. I'm gonna wash my hands again then. See, Amy has the book. Ha. Uh, I'm. No, the chicken book. Don't be a weirdo. <laughs> All right, so I'm just gonna shove that garlic in there too. It's supposed to go in with the herbs. Um, not a not a necessary thing, but uh, it's the whole roasted cloves in there would be nice. Give it some fun flavors. So if you guys didn't catch that, there is garlic that you can shove into the bird with the herbs. Yep. Okay. All right. I think they're all good. Should all the right. chicken be on its back? No. Oh. Yes. The chicken should be on its back. Um, so Wait. you can see my bird right now. The, the breast is positioned up. The legs are positioned up. The back, the tailbone, and the, the back of the neck are all uh, on the bottom of the pan. So... Good this question. is our presentation side. This is why we're going to roast it up like this, because this is our presentation. Okay, you going okay. to the oven? Yep. All right, I'm trying to get this back where it goes. <laughs> but my arm is falling asleep. <laughs> Perfect. Is All it, right. Is that where it goes? Yeah. Really? That's great. Sweet. You're a rock star. Well, hey. You're hired. Okay. So now I still want to work on my cutting board, so I'm actually going to wash my cutting board up. And make sure I get all that chicken out of here. You didn't um, turn your heat down, right? It's still on 450 yeah. or 4. Yeah, so our, our oven's on 425. What we're going to do is we're going to let that go for about 20, 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. Um, to really start to build some color out uh, at that high temp. But it's really going to give us some great color. And that's what we're looking for. You know, when we talk about cooking in some of these classes that we've done, the constant is caramelization. Flavor comes from caramel. So we want to brown the sugar, the natural sugars that are in that chicken and really start to um, get that flavor on that. We want to darken that. 
Um, so that's what we're working on right now. What do you let's see? Monica Randall has joined, and she says, "What do you say about people that do it upside down to keep it juicy?" Yeah, I, I mean that's definitely uh, a fell safe. I think those chickens never have the the beautiful presentation though, because they've been cooked essentially in all that moisture. So it's more of a braised chicken, in my opinion than it is a uh, roasted chicken, just because it's sitting in that liquid and it's cooking at a slow temp. Um, so but, versus ours, which is sitting dry. It's sitting dry, okay. and roasting. You know, it's a dry cooking method. So we're not doing a moist cooking method. Um, you know, and on, on, on that upside, you know, your your bones are, are pretty much on the bottom. Your back bones are they're all on the bottom, so. You need a bigger sink, baby. Yeah. <laughs> I'm ready to renovate when you are. So anybody out there know somebody who renovates kitchens? <laughs> We're getting quotes currently. <laughs> and if I renovate, I mean renovate light. Like, <laughs> reno light. <laughs> All right. So now i got a clean cutting board and a clean work surface. Um, the next thing we're going to start on is our lentils, right? Oh, weird lentils. So the lentils are going to take a good... 25, 30 minutes to cook. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna cook those in a pot, a nice sauce pot. So this is what we're gonna build the lentils in. Um, that's uh, that's gonna give us enough uh, area to be able to add stock and then slowly simmer them because that's the cooking method we're doing. We always talk about cooking methods, dry or moist. Now we're going into simmering. That's a, that's a moist cooking method versus the chicken we're roasting. That's a dry cooking method. So Lucy's all for it. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this mirepoix. We've got this mirepoix, uh, celery, carrot, onion, 50% onion, 25% celery, 25% carrot. Uh, when you're down in the south and you're down in Louisiana, uh, we call it the trinity. So we replace the carrot for green bell pepper. Uh, but it's the foundation for, for uh, most sauces, stocks, um, soups, um, and even uh, a lot of your grains uh, and legumes. So uh, we're going to saute that first. We have also have um, some chopped garlic. And, there, and I'm doing this cold on, on my cutting board right now, just getting it in the pan. We've got some chopped garlic. We're going to throw that into the pan as well. And... We're gonna take our oil and we're gonna add half of that container. So one of those uh, tablespoons that's in there. Can you say, um, back up what you did? Did you have mirepoix and something else? Sorry. Yep. So in this pan, I've got the mirepoix, I've got the oil, I've got the garlic. And what was the percentage? You were talking about percentages on something. Yeah, so mirepoix is 25% celery, 25% carrot, 50% onion. And that applies to whatever you're making. Um, but that's going to be the base of our lentils. That's what we're going to saute right now. So once you have those in the pan, we're going to take that to a burner. We're going to go to high heat because we're going to start high. We're going to start caramelizing that veg lightly, right? We want to we want to sweat that vegetable, um, really start to get it uh, working before we add in um, the, the lentils. And then we add in the wine. And then we add in the stock. So we're going to be using the large container for our stock. We're going to grab one of those things of wine. Why no? <laughs> me? That's what it says. No, I'm not calling you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then... Um, Where are you? Lentils. Yeah. I'm trying to piece Black together. My, my, my menu got wet, so I'm trying to piece it together. Chicken stock, mirepoix, garlic, canola oil, white wine. Yeah, beautiful. So I'm making sure I'm cooking along with you all because I want to. I want to follow. I want to follow suit. So these black beluga lentils. I mean, they're really pretty. Um, you know, when you think about lentils, you've got red lentils, green, yellow, um, and black. Uh, all of them have different types of textures when you cook them. What I like about the black lentils, it it actually holds its shape really well. Um, it doesn't get mushy like a green or a red lentil would. You can have um, a little energy. Yeah. Oh, you did. Okay, sorry. Say what you had. Or All right. So I just got the oil, the garlic, and the mirepoix in here. So I'm really just lightly sauteing those vegetables 
to start building the foundation. As you're cooking, you're building foundation. You're building a foundation of flavors. No matter what you're cooking, you're braising something, you're, you're making a, a really amazing soup, you've got to build flavor upon flavor upon flavor. You're building layers and layers and layers and layers. And you do that by utilizing different techniques. Is your food talking to you? My food is talking to me right now. <laughs> So you're just stirring it so it doesn't stick to the bottom of the pan, right? Yeah, because you're just I, moving it around. And, and this one, I'm not looking for a color right now. So, you know, I want to keep this translucent. I'm, I'm cooking this uh, to keep my onions translucent. I don't want to brown the garlic. I'm not looking for a hardcore roast on that. Just a light saute. Then I'm going to add the lentils. So go ahead and add both of your lentils to that container, to that pot, and then stir those vegetables in there. And you're gonna see this really beautiful color of the mirepoix uh, contrast against that black lentil. How many, just... how many oils did you have? Sorry. Uh, we, had two. Two. we had two containers. Did you put them both in there? No, nope, oh, I just, just used one. half of one. Half of one, okay. Okay, so at this point, you can see my lentils. There's a, a really nice shine to them. They're raw still. So what we're going to do is we're going to put that back into the heat just to really get that up because then we're going to deglaze with the wine. Like we talked about, building flavors, building layer upon layer upon layer. That's what you're shooting for. So we start by sauteing that garlic in the mirepoix. Then we add in the, the lentil to give it a light toast on that heat, the oil. Then we're going to add the white wine to deglaze it. And as the wine cooks down, the alcohol cooks off. You're going to have all the flavor of that wine actually in there. So we're going to reduce that. Wait, uh, no flames though, right? <laughs> like the tequila, you're not going to like flame, right? The alcohol is not that high. Okay. Okay, so now my lenses, I can fill them. They're lightly sticking to the bottom of this pan. <laughs> I don't want them to burn. So I'm going to use my white wine. And you have just one of those, right? Just one. You have the other one. The other one we're going to save for the stock uh, or for the sauce. So you have one of these white wines. You're gonna pour that right in there. Oh my gosh. There's no flame. Let's just keep lazy. Seriously. You gotta warn me, I'm sitting in here. <laughs> There's no flame, it's a very low alcohol content. All we're doing is deglazing, we're releasing that. And we wanna just cook that wine down really quick. It's gonna cook down fast because the lentils are starting to suck up that juice. They're starting to suck up that flavor. But now you've got this garlic, this carrot, this celery, this onion, these toasted lentils all cooking with that wine. You're going to cook that till it's uh, what we call offset, almost dry. There's not a lot of moisture left in the pan. When you reach that point, this is where your chicken stock comes in. So go ahead and add all your chicken stock to that pan and it's going to calm down. Thank you. <laughs> Her anxiety was to hear. I just put the air conditioner on lower. <laughs> okay. All right. Somebody had three wines. We just used one of the wine cups, right? Oh, we do have three wines. Yeah. Same. My bad. We got three. Okay. But did you use, we only used one, right? What is the recipe yeah. call for? Yeah. I only used one. So okay. we're going to use one on the carrot, one on the sauce. So we have three, but we haven't made it to the carrot or the sauce yet. So you don't the white wine says two ounces. So that's two ounces. Yep. Okay, cool. Okay. So, as Tina kindly reminded me, I can't cross contaminate my salt. So, um, if you have some more salt, you need to put your hands all in it because I did and I totally messed that up. I was um, like, you're teaching cross contamination. No, I yeah, you're right. You were absolutely right. Just um, use my little shaker. I'm not using a little shaker. <laughs> Kosher salt. Um, I'm just going to add a little bit more salt to the pan. So that was about two pinches. Um, I did a heavy pinch of salt to go in there, just because I don't want to mix the salt that we put chicken all in. Um, even though it's going to cook, we're just going to be safe because I was practicing it. And you just use um, one chicken stock container, right? Some people- A large one. The okay. small one is going to be for your sauce in a little bit, because your chicken is cooking right now. So when we get to the point of being able to uh, make the sauce, we're going to use that chicken stock to do that. So you put the large chicken sauce in the pan. Yep, so the large chicken stock is what we're using, the quart is what we're using for uh, these lentils right now. So at this point, we've got the, the mirepoix saute, the garlic, the lentils, the oil, 
all of that was lightly sauteed together. We deglazed it with some white wine. And it's still on high, right? It's still on high at this point. Um, I added the chicken stock, and then I added two pinches of salt or one heavy pinch of salt. The thing when you're cooking beans, grains, potatoes, pasta, um, you want to cook the salt flavor into that, that, that product because it's going to be really hard to add it at the end, right? It's got to simmer in there. It's got to impart its flavor in there. So the salt is actually going to cook itself into that chicken stock and flavor that, that, that legume really well. Um, I'm going to turn this down to a medium heat because I'm looking for a simmer. I'm not looking for a boil. You know, when we talk about cooking methods, moist cooking methods, um, you know, this is a, a simmer. So we want it to lightly break the surface. We don't want to boil, which is like hardcore, right? We want a, a simmer. So we want it to lightly simmer. If it's not breaking the surface, then you're poaching, right? So we're looking for something to simmer. So turn down the heat to a medium, allow that liquid to come to a simmer, and we want a slow simmer because we don't want to force that liquid into those grains and burst them, right? Or excuse me, those legumes and burst them. We want to, we want to slowly simmer them and let them become tender, right? But at its, at its own pace, right? We're not going to force it. So that's when we talk to a lot of our, our young chefs about controlling heat. Just because it goes high doesn't mean you have to use it high. You get to control the heat. So cooking is about controlling temperature. How do you know if you should like cover it versus not cover it when you're simmering? It depends what you're doing. Um, you know, with a braise, you're going to want to cover. So this is where, you know, if you're braising something, you're going to cover it because you want that moisture to stay in there. You want, you don't want the steam to evaporate off. Um, most things are simmered uncovered. Uh, that's, that's pretty common. Uh, just because you're controlling the heat to whatever temperature you want and you're watching the evaporation because the steam is cooking off. So you're watching that. You're paying attention to that. Um, we're not going to boil this hard enough and long enough to evaporate all this liquid before it's cooked. We're going to control the temperature to slowly simmer uh, these black lentils with these vegetables and end up with something that's really, really tasty. So Paloma question, A, it's delicious. B, let's see, I lost the question. It was from Kathleen. She wants to know the percentage. Oh, yeah. Oh, Catherine, excuse me. Um, what percentage of grapefruit and lime juice do you use? Um, so uh, grapefruit, it's a citrus element. Um, you know, I'd say that's probably an ounce to, to two ounces of tequila. Um for me personally, um, I, I, I like to have a lot more tequila in mine, um, <laughs> but I, for me, that's, that's about the balance. Okay, cool. And why so many lentils? Bradley asked. Is that a serving of four? Yeah. Yeah. We're thinking four people. Um, and, um, the chicken is approaching, a 16 minutes ish in there. Right, well, let's check the chicken. That's a, that's a great call. Let's check the chicken. So we're going to open that up, see what's looking like Oh, for me right now. Um, I'm almost there on the color that I'm looking for. It's It's got a, a little bit of yellow to it, a little bit of golden happening, uh, but it's not that caramelization there just yet. But what I did is I touched the skin just to see um, how uh, dry it was, and it was actually really dry. So um, another thing that you're all, I'm always thinking about is, you know, how's the – How's the, the chicken doing while it's in the oven? There was a chef I had the opportunity to work for um, years ago, and he didn't believe in putting anything in the oven because he felt like he lost his connection to the food once it went behind that door. He couldn't see it anymore. He couldn't talk to it, and that was a big thing. In his, in his kitchen, he had nothing but open flames, and that's how he cooked. I mean, one of the greatest chefs of our generation. All right, so carrots. Beautiful rainbow carrots. These have gorgeous color. Sorry, before we move to the carrots. Okay. We're assuming everybody's chicken looked kind of like yours because we all did it together at the same mm -hmm. time. But if somebody, if they feel like it's not the colors that you were saying, uh -huh. what should they be thinking about around that? Yeah. So what you're thinking about when it comes to the color of the chicken, when to turn the temperature down, is you've built a beautiful golden brown hue on the outside of that 
that chicken. It's, it's starting to hit this color scheme right here. That's that's what I'm paying attention to is does it have the, co the color, the, the golden color that I'm looking for? Um, I'm not looking for burnt. I'm not looking for dark. I'm looking for golden. Okay, and if, it, if theirs is golden, should uh -huh. they be doing anything with the temperature? Yep. Just so once know. once we get to the point where the, the chickens are golden, we're going to drop that temperature down to 325. Uh, so we're going to take 100 degrees off of it. Um, and if you're working with a conventional, you're going to drop down to 350. But all things equal, their birds should look pretty much like yours, and we're still at 450. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we should all be right there. Um, and I'm probably... My guess is that another five minutes at that temp before I drop it down and really let that let that uh, temperature just start to to slowly um, you know come down and cook that chicken. And who is the chef we're just talking about? Uh, Alain Passard. Okay. So Alain Passard uh, is famous for uh, his restaurant um, La Rapage in in France. Um, I had the opportunity to work with him in California when I was a much younger chef and. Uh, one of the one of the greatest experiences um, because you know he's such a um, an amazing chef when it comes to, to cooking in the, in this in this uh, this industry um, you know he's anyway he's amazing <laughs> all right so okay. man crush <laughs> it's not a man crush <laughs> all right I just respect the dude all right so we have carrots now the thing is you know carrots are different sizes. So skinny carrot is going to cook a lot faster than this larger carrot. So that's one of the things you want to be thinking about when you're working with vegetables. Um, how fast are they going to cook? And, and, and I don't want some of them to be mushy, some of them to be crunchy. Um, you know, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a key piece. So um, something I'm always thinking about with that. So... We did a little bit of knife skills last week. What we're gonna do is we're gonna just clean these carrots up with a knife. So very simple. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut them into pieces that are about the same size. So this skinny carrot is obviously very small. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut off the end, the, just that, that, that tip, right? The, the stem, that, the first part that pokes out of the ground uh, before the leaves. Um, I'm gonna cut that off of all of them first. And I'm also gonna cut off these little ends, right? The end of the, the carrot, the, the root portion of it. So I'm gonna cut just that tip off and get that out of there. Now, if you're, you're trying to do something rustic, it looks really gorgeous when you do that. Um, you know, you could, you could roast these whole and they would be just as pretty, but we're gonna cut, we're gonna cut them down because we're gonna make glazed carrots. Um, so we're gonna do that with all the carrots. We're gonna take those tips off and we're gonna take the stems off all the way through. And the lentils are fine, right? They're just over there simmering and... Yeah, so my lentils right now are actually boil, boiling a little bit too hard. I'm breaking the surface rapidly. So I'm gonna drop it down to a medium low. You can go the, other, the wrong way there. Just to give me um, a slower simmer. I want to simmer, I don't want a rapid boil. So I'm dropping that down. And, and what you'll start to smell on those lentils as well is you'll smell the lentils um, expanding, but you'll also start to smell the chicken stock that's in there, the aromatics from the vegetables, the garlic, the wine, all of that simmering together. So I'm going to turn that down to a lower heat because I don't want to force the liquid in there. I want it to slowly simmer. Do I need to show your cutting board or are you just cutting the tips off here? Yeah, I'm going to hold them up in just a moment. Okay, cool. Um, so at this point, all I've done with these carrots is cut that end off and cut that stem off just to get them all to that point. Now I've washed all my carrots. I'll wash them again just for you guys so I can do it with you. Um, just to make sure, carrots grow in the dirt. And uh, you don't want to eat dirt, so always wash the vegetables. Do you remember when I was trying to grow carrots in our garden at our old house? And I was so excited because the stem was like this big, uh -huh. but then the carrot was like an inch long. <laughs> That's the problem with growing carrots is they need space, right? Oh, so sad. <laughs> because when you plant carrot seeds, um, you know, they, they poke up and you have to, you have to thin out the herd. You have to get rid of, you know, a lot of these guys when they're really, really tiny, because when they grow, you know, if there's two or three together, they're going to, they're going to grow and they need this much room to grow. So, you know, this is why this one's very thin because he was too close to someone. So he didn't have the room to get, you know, the space that he needed. 
I just remember being devastated because I thought I was going to put carrots in a salad that night. <laughs> I was like, that's okay. it? Now, I'm going to save these scraps, right? I'm not ignoring you. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I'm going to save these scraps just before you throw them away. If you threw them away already, it's not a big deal. But I'm going to throw them um, actually onto my chicken because that's just more flavor. It's talking. It's talking. And we're actually going to pull it out and look at that. Okay, so my bird at this point is starting to get some good color. Got a little bit of golden happening on there. I feel comfortable turning this down now. So I'm going to drop my temperature. Because you're convection. Because I'm convection at 325. And if you're conventional, 350. Right? Yep, and if you're at conventional, drop the 350. And now we're going to let this cook. We're going to let it do its job. We're, we're going we're gonna to focus on the lentils and the carrots while the chicken cooks. So now you want to be thinking about how do I get these carrots to, to be about the same size. So something thin like this, um, I, I personally love the skin of a carrot. I, I, I know a lot of chefs pill them. I, I think there's a lot of flavor in the skin of a carrot. Um, and I like to keep that on there. It looks really pretty when you take it off, but... Um, I don't know. I, I'm. I, I think it's. I think it's gorgeous. So a thin piece of carrot like that, I'm only going to cut into two pieces, right? Two pieces, because when I cut, and I'm I'm cutting these at an angle. So when I when I cut the carrot at an angle, you know the next ones I'm cutting to match something very similar. Now I'm okay with something that is. Uh, imperfect. I think cooking should be imperfect because nature is imperfect. Um, but I'm cutting these carrots to be somewhat thick. I'd say it's probably about a half inch of, of carrot. Um, um, I think if your chicken's not getting the color um, at this point, uh, you're still okay to turn it down. We can always blast at the end to get a little bit more color on it. I'll, I'll, we'll go into that. But go ahead and turn your chicken down to, to the, the 325 or 350 temp. Um, so I'm going to cut all these carrots to about that size. That way I have carrots that all match something equivalent to what that first small one was because I want them all to cook evenly. And carrots are beautiful, especially as we get into the summer. Um, you know, there's such an easy way to add a pop of color to your dinner. Um, you know, they're a root vegetables, so they hold up really well to a lot of different cooking techniques. Um, and if you guys, since you can't see, I want you to know all he's doing is cutting the carrots at an angle. And they're all about the same size. You want me to move this so they can, well, you're done now. Yeah. You're fast. Sorry. I feel like you're kind of showing off. I'm not showing off. So the carrots, oh. you know. <laughs> I've cut, I've cut down just to all about the same size. So show a couple like the purple yellow, just so they can see. Yeah. For comparison. Just so, you know, a red one, about a half inch thick. I've just cut on a long bias cut. Same thing with the oranges. I've got all those about the same, but then you take one of those skinny ones that we had in the beginning and it's about the same size. So that's what I'm looking at is trying to get these all very similar. Um, as far as how much we cook them. Uh, so looking at these lentils, and that's the beauty of cooking. You can see we're doing a whole bunch of things at once because I'm thinking about you know how this is all gonna come together. Once the chicken's ready and it's resting, we're gonna finish off the sauce in the pan. We got the lentils that are simmering. They're fine if they finish early because they can sit on the back stove um, and be served appropriately at the right time. Um, and then the carrots, you know, the carrots, I, I can take to a, to a temperature uh, and stage to where, you know, I'm ready to glaze them, but you know, they're not quite there. What we're gonna do with the carrots is we're actually gonna take um, just a saute pan. We're gonna turn it on high heat because we wanna caramelize the carrots first. So I'm gonna get this pan hot. So if you were with me for the steak class, it's very similar to that. We're getting the pan hot so we can actually caramelize the, uh, the carrots. Um, that's gonna be a key piece. Now carrots have a lot of sugar in them, so they caramelize really well. And this is why glazed carrots is such a, a perfect um, style to do this. We have a question. Yeah, you didn't cut any of those larger carrots in half first. You just went at an angle and, and went for it, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. So I literally just took that carrot and I cut it at an angle. So, you know, Should've a long been. angle to where. Should have put, yeah, that one. You know, I ended up, if that was my whole carrot, it's got an angle cut. And that's how I got to that part. Thank you. <laughs> hey, no one needs your input, Lucy. Eat your food. <laughs> So um, when we get to these carrots, uh, we're gonna need a couple things. We're gonna need our oil, right? So we still got two tablespoons of oil left in the in the kit. We're gonna need our white wine and our honey. So we're gonna grab one of those wines, one of the, that 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 honey. Um, we're gonna add, add the butter and the cayenne. And then we still have our salt and pepper. So as the pan's getting hot, and this is one thing, the pan's dry. There's nothing in the pan at this point. The pan to get extremely hot before I add the carrots and then I add the oil because I want to build a great caramelization. I don't want um, steam in there. I want high fat. I want heat. And I want to brown the sugar that's in these carrots. Now, these carrots are raw right now. Um, you know, you could blanch them at this point if you wanted to do them for like a crudite, you know, because these are gorgeous. These are so pretty, these rainbow carrots. Um, if you were to bring some water to a boil, heavily salted, throw that in there, um, that would turn into something that, uh, you know, you would drop in for like 30, 40 seconds and then go straight into ice. And that would be something that you could use for a crudite. But we're going to pan roast these. We're going to get some color on them. So the pan's getting hot. I can barely touch the pan at this point. And your lentils are simmering. My lentils are still simmering. I'm going to grab all these carrots. I'm going straight to the pan. Now remember, there's nothing in that pan right now. It's dry. I'm getting the carrots in there first because we washed the carrots. They got a little bit of water on them. They're talking. I want the water to come off. I want the steam uh, to get out of there before before I actually add the oil because. When you add oil to water, no, 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 no. <laughs> it pops. It doesn't like each other. Um, so we're trying to evaporate as much of that water as we can at this point, and this is why we're using a dry pan. But I need the heat to be there. So I also know the carrots are cold right now because we washed them. They were in a cooler. Um, so I'm thinking about that as well. You know, as soon as you put something cold into a pan, it's going to cool it down. Um, you need that heat to come back up. So I'm letting that pan continue to stay warm, cook off whatever last little bit of water is on there before I add the oil. Once I add the oil, then we begin the caramelization process. And I think that's something that's really important uh, when, you're, when you're sauteing is to maintain the heat because saute means to jump. It means to, to, to cook. Um, uh, in a slope pan with high heat and a small amount of fat it means to jump. So I'm going to take the lids off of all those ingredients. Hey, real quick. Yep. Um, so you started that carrot pan on high, high, high. Yep. You threw the carrots in. It was dry. Uh -huh. you're, you're cooking off the water. And then have you reduced that heat? No, it's still hot. Okay, so it's still hot. So you can see my carrots are actually starting to smoke a little bit, which what that's telling me is that most of the water's cooked off. You know, that last little bit of steam that I've got coming off the top means that's the end of the water. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my oil, and that's that two tablespoons. We're going to add all of that. Oh, that's making me nervy. I love you. And we're going to start to caramelize the carrots. Now, I'm not going to mess with the pan right now. Don't touch the pan. Allow the carrots to start caramelizing. The sugar that's in them, let them brown. Don't mess with it. It's hard, too, because you want to shake it. You want to be like, you know, I can flip it. Leave it alone at this point. That's an extremely, extremely important part because we need whatever water content that's left in there to evaporate. We need the temperature to get back up. We just added cold oil, so we need the temperature to come back high. So you'll hear the cracking and the popping because that's the water that's still in the carrot, right? Carrots have a lot of water in them naturally. So the additional water we put on there, we got to get off of um, as well. So my, my lentils are simmering. My carrots now 
are starting to talk to me, right? Now that I can hear this pan um, doesn't really have a lot of water evaporation, doesn't have a lot of steam coming off of it, I'm going to go ahead and shake it up. I'm going to stir it up now. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> okay? And what you'll see is if you look at the edges of the carrots, you'll start to see a little bit of browning. That's the caramelization that we're trying to bring out. So we're going to put this back on the heat. And we're going to let them brown. We're going to let them caramelize. We're going to let it sit there. Let that water come out. Let that heat come back up and allow the carrots to caramelize. How's everybody doing? Feel good so far? I'm trying to go slow. It's really hard because I, like I, I like to cook fast. I'm so proud of you just for only using three pans so far. Because usually you cook and there's like 17 pans and pots and every utensil we own is dirty. Well, the thing too is I, I think a lot of people don't have um, all the crazy contraptions. And so when we write these recipes, we're thinking about that. You know, what can your your normal person who's not a chef pull off at home? Uh, where, where can they buy the lentils if they're if they're local or where do you get? Yeah, them? I mean, I've I've seen them at Whole Foods. I've seen them at at King Supers. Um, most markets carry them. Um, just go in your grain section. Um, you'll see uh, sometimes they're in the the Middle Eastern section, um, or uh, you'll find them in like the the area that has like a lot of the the Bob's uh, Mill uh, products. <laughs> Uh, where you'll find like xanthan gum and things, black seeds, things like that. Uh, sometimes I've seen them in there as well. But this technique works for any grain or legume. So if you're making farro, you're you're cooking bulgur wheat, you're you're uh, cooking beans. This is the same technique that we would use all the way through. I'm literally simmering light and slow. Um, the only difference is I don't have to soak these lentils because they're so small. Well, again, I was just saying thank you. So many people always ask me, they're like, hey, Tina, does brother cook and you do the dishes? And I'm like, no way. I'll do laundry or something. I'm not cleaning up the 17 pots of pans. <laughs> it's fair, right? So now this pan has been sitting, there's condensation building up. I haven't really messed with it since that one toss. Now I'm going to toss again because I can smell the sugar. Oh, it's talking. That's what I'm listening to is that I can smell the sugar in there. Because I toss those carrots, I'm just flipping them over to be able to get the other side because we're trying to evenly caramelize the carrot. And this works for many, many vegetables. If, if you're working with other root vegetables, celery root, turnips, um, you know, different types of, of squashes, you're working with broccoli or onions, this caramelization technique works on all of them. You just have to control the heat and toss properly to be able to build that caramelization evenly. That's well, great. Everybody says they're doing good. They, they're with you. You're it's good pace. So the lentils I'm checking right now. I always, I, you know, for me, I like to taste. I, this is one thing we, we teach a lot of our cooks is we have tons of tasting spoons in the kitchen um, because we're trying to build palates. You know, when something's done right, when something's seasoned properly. So tasting is one of the most important parts. So I want to taste the lentils to kind of see where they're at. You know, where's the texture at? How's the salt content? Because this is where I can adjust it at this point. So Hot. as I taste those lentils, <laughs> they're still underdone. They still got about another 10 minutes on them. Now, what told you that? Did they have like a texture, like a crunch still? Okay. Like I can still taste a little bit of rawness in there. Um, Tasting rawness? <laughs> we didn't taste them when they were raw. Like, tell the people who don't eat so, like <laughs> um, there, There's resistance on the bite. They're not as soft as I want them to be. Um, and they stick to the teeth still. Um, there's still a tooth to them. So the carrots now, I'm controlling a little bit more. I'm, I'm tossing a little bit more because <clears throat> I can see the caramel happening. I can see the sugar happening. So now I'm starting to toss that pan because every time you toss that pan, <clears throat> you're bringing in the cold air. And when you bring in that cold air, you're reducing the temperature. Then you put it back on the heat to increase the temperature. And this is how we control that. Oh, Paloma break. <laughs> <laughs> Someone choke on the lentil. Um, 
So that's a key piece for, 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 for roasting these vegetables right now is really controlling the, the caramelization all the way through. So you've got so many things going on. Obviously you start, maybe it's not obvious. You start with the thing that takes the longest to cook. So the chicken basically went in the oven about 530 at the high, high heat of 450. Uh -huh. And we kept it there 20, 25 minutes. Yep. It got golden brown and then we reduced by 100 degrees, mm -hmm. right? Now that thing is just cooking. This is doing its thing. The lentils you started with a mirepoix, you yep. know, the white wine. The garlic. Right, the garlic. The oil. And high, you started the high heat together, mm -hmm. right? Started on the high heat. And then chicken Added stock. the chicken stock, and then we drop it down to a simmer. So now it's, you know, if, if you look at this pan, it's 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 like a, uh, it's like a small lava pit. It's barely breaking the surface. It's just kind of, kind of bubbling lightly. The and carrots the carrot, now yeah. are still on high heat. But I'm controlling the temperature by tossing them and cooling it down. So every time you toss it, it stops. Okay, talk about the shape of that pan and why you can toss. Because I think yeah. it's scary for people who don't do that. I I threw food everywhere when you showed me that. So uh, one of the one of the ways I personally learned uh, when I was a when I was a teenager in, in kitchens on how to toss was actually taking a dry cold pan, uh, a saute pan, which is sloped, uh, which means to jump. And putting a piece of toast uh, or a slice of bread in the pan and actually flipping that and practicing that motion of flipping the piece of toast to be able to get comfortable with the motion of tossing vegetables or tossing an egg. Um, that's how you build up that confidence. So, you know, when you, everyone's walking around the house tossing a piece of toast around, <laughs> make sure you tag me because that's going to be hilarious. We need the videos. Hey, so what, <laughs> when we use the wine and the lentils that we burned off, what, what kind of wine was that? Is it like a white dry? Yeah, that was just a Chablis. Um, oh, just a Chablis, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> just a Chablis. <laughs> um, <laughs> any white wine. You know, I, I always like Julia Child's uh, perspective. You you wouldn't drink it, don't use it. Um, I, I think that's a, that's a great way. You know, I mean, you can see just sitting on our shelf, we've got... Uh, a Pinot Grigio sitting here. Because once wine uh, turns in our house, we keep it for cooking. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if if you it know, doesn't you, turn <clears throat> often. If you <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wine doesn't turn often around here. But if you have wine that um, you know you open up and 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 you can smell that 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 uh, um, that wine's beginning to turn, save it for cooking. You know, I keep my red wines and our white wines to the side because I, I'm not worried about now um, trying to drink it for its flavor profiles. Um, now I'm using it for cooking. Hey, if, it, if there's a good break, I think you should talk about the tasting spoon and like how big of a deal that is in kitchens. Like you've battled for spoons before, like you've thrown <laughs> down and like it's like a big deal to take someone's tasting spoon. Only if there's time. I think it's, people don't get to see the behind the scenes stuff in the kitchen and how yeah. chefs, like you've spent $9 on a spoon before. I was like, no. <laughs> it was 15 um, <laughs> well, you $15 on a spoon because it was your tasting spoon. So, so, so chefs, chefs are, are very, um, meticulous and, and weird with their quirks. Uh, but one of, one of the things that I think a lot of us have in common, um, is spoons. We all love spoons. Uh, we work with, you know, heavy duty spoons that we keep on our station in a sanitizer solution, but that's what we cook with. So most chefs, if they're working a saute station or they're working a plating station, um, they're working with a spoon. So you want something that's comfortable to your hand. You want something that has the right shape. You want something that's the right weight. You want something that's large enough. Um, and then chefs collect crazy sp spoons. So, you know, if you have a chef friend, ask them to see their spoons. Um, but yes, we've, sometimes we have, you know, cooking competitions against each other and we battle for spoons. I mean, if you got a nice spoon, I'm probably gonna take it. I find the weirdest spoon. I'm like, what is this? I think the best one was um, was our friend um, Aaron with the he had a retractable yeah, spoon. It was a, a TV antenna, but on the end of it was actually a spoon uh, tip, so he could extend it and then taste <laughs> your food from over here. It was the funniest thing ever. All right, so my carrots now have some beautiful caramelization. You know, I'm, I'm looking at these carrots; they've got great color on the edges. Um, they're starting to fry almost. So this is where I'm gonna take that white wine, one of those full containers, and I'm gonna deglaze it completely. It's oh, gonna to talk. Brother. Okay. It's not gonna flame up. <laughs> she is so scarred from that. Well, you burned down the house almost last time. I'm sorry, everybody, but there, there was a moment of panic. 
He wasn't panicked. If you watch the video, his face says he's very bored with me. But I was panicked. <laughs> so at this point, the carrots now are are uh, deglazing, right? The, the the caramelization that's stuck to the bottom of the pan, we just deglaze. We release from the bottom of the pan. I'm going to take a pinch of salt and throw it on there. And I'm reducing that wine now to be able to essentially, you know, cook down. I don't want the alcohol. I want the flavor of that white wine in there. So you put white wine over those carrots, and now you're just reducing them. We're reducing it. them down. So, um, what would be a good wine to pair with this? I don't know if Steve and Myra are still watching, but what do you think, Chef? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think uh, most whites are going to work great with a roasted chicken. chicken. Um, a Pinot Grigio would be great. I think a Vignet would be nice. Um, an Albarino would be really good, all that acidity. Um, that would be okay. my, my call. Now, even a great Chardonnay. I mean, what do you have in your hand? Uh, so, I have the honey now. So the honey and the heat's still on high, right? right? The heat's still on high, but I can hear the the wine is evaporating. So I'm going to take that honey and I'm going to drizzle it over the top of these carrots. So what's happening is is I'm increasing the sugar content into the pan. Um, I'm also going to balance the heat, the the flavors. Now I'm going to take a small pinch of cayenne. Oh, you choked on that last. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just a small pinch. Cayenne goes a long way. It's going to give me a little bit of heat. I'm going to toss those carrots in that honey, that wine. Oh, our Psalm's wife said, or a nice rosé. Always rosé all day. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to finish it with the butter. So that butter that we had, go ahead and add all that butter in there. And, and that's going to finish off those carrots to be glazed. And it's still on high, but you're introducing a little air here to reduce the temperature, but mm -hmm. your, your flame is still on high. Yeah, so at this point with the butter, I'm removing the pan from the heat because I don't want the butter to melt down and just separate. I want it to melt down in its emulsified form. Butter is, is fat that has milk, solids, and water, and it's all whipped together at the right temperature to be able to cut into those bricks. So once it's cold enough, it forms into that. When you melt that down, the water actually cooks out, the milk solids come to the bottom, and the fat rises to the top. We don't want it to separate. So the way we don't allow that to separate so it stays creamy is we actually remove it from the heat and allow it to stay somewhere in that temperature to where it naturally was. So I don't want this in a really, really high heat. I just want a nice glaze to happen and round out the fat on these carrots. So the carrots. I'm taking off the heat, put them to the side, they're good. Well, let's talk that through really quick because you kept that flame on high and you control the temperature by moving the pan away and yeah. tossing air back Absolutely. into that to cool it down. Okay. Yeah, so it wasn't it wasn't about, you know, the I was controlling the temperature by by controlling the pan. I wasn't controlling the temperature by controlling the heat because some kitchens you work in, uh, the heat never turns down. So you have to be able to work, you know, if you're working on a French top. You have to know where the hot spots are and you have to control the heat. The lentils are breaking. You hear the lentils talking. Me too. Don't bust them. All right. So the lentils now are getting nice and plump. And that's what I'm looking for. I can hear the water starting to evaporate in there. I can see that they're 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 really getting the plumpness that I want. Um they're really close. And I'm sure, you know, they're probably a few minutes out. It was hot. Ah! I don't know how you Okay. I probably got like three more minutes, Bum. Oh, yeah, because <laughs> they're not as raw, but still a little sticky on the teeth. They still got a little bit of a chew to them. Okay. So I'm going to turn this heat down just a little bit more because I don't want to evaporate all that chicken stock out of there. So lentils like medium now? They're on low right now. They're on low now. Yeah. Well, you broke your uh, simmer. That was boiling, right? So you have to really kind of... What, what, what you were hearing was actually the, the lack of liquid um, to the, the the mass of the solid grain. So it was actually, you know, trying to grab more liquid to pull in, mm. but you were getting pockets of air. So that's what that sound was. Gotcha. So now I don't want, I don't want to, to continuously boil these at this point because they're close. I'm going to turn down a low heat for the next five minutes and just let them sit there on the very lowest setting um, to continue cooking while we check this chicken. You're checking the chicken? Checking the chicken, the chickadee china, chicken. Chickadee china, the Chinese chicken? Yeah. That
that song. <laughs> All right, so let's check this chicken. All right, so what are you checking for now? Oh, you're touching it again. Yep. But what about people who can fill their fingertips still? Like, what should they do? <laughs> so, man, I'll pull the chicken out so everyone can see. So at this point, I think it's pretty. the chicken's looking gorgeous. I mean, it's it's got beautiful color to it. Um, what I'm looking for on this chicken are a couple things. Um, if you don't have a thermometer, one of the things that we would do to test if the chicken's done is actually just take a small knife and pierce. Is that a small knife too? This is not a small knife. Oh. <laughs> um, but we would pierce the, the, the thigh um, and right, right underneath the leg. So I can do that. Yeah, it's pants heavy. Yeah. Um, okay, hold on. Let's, let's check it out. So if you don't have a thermometer, you would take a small knife. Let me see how this camera is. And you could actually, wait, wait, wait. I don't know if I'm there yet. You can see me. I'll see you. Okay. So if you would take a small knife and you would actually pierce a thick spot on it, the juice that comes out Ooh, it's clear. is clear. Uh, and if it's pink, it means it still needs some more to cook. So that's a great indicator of how to know, you know, when your bird is done going into a thick portion like that and testing that. The other thing you can do is if you have a thermometer. Mm, it's in your knife kit usually. I don't need to keep on. I have a couple here. Oh. So if you have a thermometer, you would actually go into a cup. I was just wondering. Uh, you would go into a couple uh, thick spots. So I'm going to go straight into the breast and I'm looking at the temperature. So this is a thick spot. It says 139. I want to take this chicken to about 155 because I'm going to let it rest and carry over that last bit. So this tells me that it needs about a few more minutes. But, you know, when I tested it down here, the juice was clear. The juice was clear. And you can see it's extremely hot down there, which means, you know, there's some of the cavity that's down there. So it's open. So make sure you check multiple spots for the clarity. Um, when you're testing that and you can even use a knife to do it, but thermometer is always the best way to go. I use digital thermometers because they're calibrated. They're, they stay that way. Um, but even a small, uh, regular thermometer works. All right. Sorry about the camera movement, everyone. Let me get it back here. So what we're going to do is I'm actually going to let that chicken go for a few more minutes because it's close. I mean, oh, knowing yeah. that attempt at, um, a little bit higher. Knowing that attempt at 139 means I'm almost to the mark of what I want. I'm going to cut my head off. I'm sorry. I'm trying. I like said the S word. I, <laughs> I don't know how to just muscle this thing back. Like, You're good. There you go. Oh, well, that's not a thing. Hold on. <laughs> sorry, everyone. My producer skills are kind of whack. I just fake it till I make it. How are you doing now? Are you in the frame? Yeah, least? yeah, it's it's perfect. All right. You're a rock star. <laughs> okay, hold on. Let's let's check for uh, questions really quick. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, they know how old we are because we said chicken the Chinese the Chinese chicken. Uh, if your skin isn't golden yet, should we increase the heat? Not yet, because we can blast at the end, right? You can always blast for color at the end. At this point, you're not you don't want to overcook the the bird, and this is something that a lot of people struggle with when they cook. Is sorry. Oh yeah, you're good. A lot of people struggle with is, um, you know, you have white meat and you have dark meat. So, you know, dark meat um, has it's, it's a lot more forgiving, right? Because it's got more fat in there, it's got more tendons in there. Um, white meat's going to dry out really quick. So, for me, I'm watching both parts because as as far as the leg and the thigh cook, you know, they're they're going to get more and more tender um, as long as they once they hit that number. So when I check that when I check that leg and thigh. And I see it's already at the 160 mark. I'm fine with that because that means it's just going to get tender. The breast meat's not there yet. So for me, that's the part that I want to control the most because that's what's really going to make this bird extremely uh, moist when people eat it is the white meat. You know that when they taste that, and they're like, "Oh, this chicken's dry." It's because you overcooked the white meat. So for me, um, when I roast the bird, that's what I'm looking for is to make sure that that center um, where I inserted right at the bottom of that breast uh, and it's close to that breast plate. Um, is, is right at that 155 mark because, you know, you want to carry it over, but the carryover cooking happens when you pull it out of the oven. So it's going to continue to cook as it sits, and you're going to get a couple more degrees on it, 
to get you to that safe mark. Uh, but for me, I take it to about 155 personally. Sidebar, Melissa says Chipotle seasoning for the popcorn from a Latin market. Which one do you use? Um, I, I like the Carniceria uh, Leonella here in Colorado Springs. That's over on Pikes Peak and Academy. Um, that's usually the, the market I go to. Um, or you can go to the Luna Market on South Academy, um, just uh, you know, a couple blocks before you reach uh, Fountain. Okay. Some people have chicken that's at – again, what's the temp you like for the carryover? Like, if it got 155. To one, so some people say, hey, my chicken's at 155. What do I do? Uh, if it's at 155, you're going to pull it out, and that's at the thickest part of the breast. You're going to insert it. Thickest part. The thickest part. So make sure that you're testing the thickest part because you don't want raw chicken. Ever. Um, also, if that same person, just in case, didn't get the golden brown, but they're at temp and now they're ready to blast, are we moving to a... If you're ready to blast it and you want a little bit more color on it, this is where you use your broil. Um, turn your uh, broiler on, which is the element at the top of the oven. Um, you're going to turn that on to 500. Um, that's going to give you an infrared coil to actually build your caramelization really quick. It's a high heat. So allow that heat to get hot and that will actually help caramelize the, the top of it for you. Hey, um, Tara asked earlier, but I missed it, and she so she reasked. Um, she has a lot of tarragon in her, her in her garden. Uh -huh. Where can you use tarragon? Uh, tarragon will work great right here. Um, you tarragon just, you is a, that in the absolutely. Bird. Okay. Just know with tarragon, tarragon is a black licorice and it's flavored um, herb. So you know you're gonna have that. Um, I love tarragon and fish is another area, white fish um, or even salmon. I, I love tarragon there. Um, and a, a tarragon worked into a hollandaise is just simply a bernaise. Uh, when you work a tarragon reduction into it. So that would be another um, another one that I would think of. So my lentils I'm also looking at have, you know, they've still got moisture in there. Um, there you go. They've still got some moisture in there. Not a lot, but this is why I have it on low heat because I'm just cooking it to the very end to get it there. So let's talk a little bit while we wait for that chicken, either get some color at home, what you're working on right now, or you're letting it get up to that final temp. And if you were broiling, like let's say you were at 155 and you're ready to broil, how long do you do that? You just watch the color. You're gonna right? watch the color, yes. So maybe Don't go burn like your chicken. Two minutes at a time, one minute, like one yeah. minute, look at it, two yeah, minutes. Yeah, keep an eye on it. It's gonna, you know, one or two minutes, but you're gonna be thinking about that. Um, so let's talk about this sauce, because this is something that, you know, when it comes to making any au jus gravy, uh, this is gonna be the technique. So if you're making prime rib, or, or you're making gravy on Thanksgiving, or you're just making a, a nice chicken gravy, this is how we would do it. So uh, we've got three ingredients left on our kit. We've got that last smaller chicken stock, we've got white wine, and we've got cornstarch. So we're gonna use the cornstarch to be our thickening agent. Uh, we're gonna do what's called a slurry. So if you take a small bowl, Add that cornstarch in. That's a cereal bowl. <laughs> and then turn your cold water on. You're going to add a little bit of cold water and use your finger, which is clean, to stir it together. And you want some resistance in what this is called a slurry. So just a little bit of water. I'd say it's probably two to one. Um, you can always add a little bit more water. What was in there? Sorry. Just cornstarch. Oh, okay. Cornstarch and water. So I'm just working the cornstarch in to get all the lumps out and make sure that there's at the bottom of it, I can feel a resistance. And that's my slurry. This is what I'm going to use to thicken this gravy. So cornstarch with a little bit of water and then you're literally using your finger to like mash up the, the big parts, I guess. What is that? Yeah. So you can see like the, the slurry chunks? now. Oh, no, you're failing. Hold on. There you go. So the slurry. It's a white bowl with white powder. Yeah. I no, no, no. It's, it's liquid. Okay. So you can see the resistance in there. And on the bottom, you can uh, you can feel a little bit of resistance in there. Did I get you? All right. So if there's a little bit of blood in, in the cavity, I, I saw someone made a comment about that. Um, that's that's not, it's, it's fine. Don't freak out. Um, that's just naturally the juice dripping on there. Um, you just make sure that when we're temping this thing, uh, we're, 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 we're going through the thickest center to fill that temp. And if, they, if she doesn't have a thermometer. And if you don't have a thermometer, um, this is where we're going to take that knife and really test the center of it. Uh, but don't worry about it inside the cavity because that's where everything's falling. 
Um, and that's where a lot of the bones are. So that's why uh, you're seeing that there, but you'll be okay. Gotcha. Okay, so what we have now is we have this white wine, we have a slurry and we have this chicken stock. We're going to make our gravy based on all the drippings. So what we were just talking about, all those flavors that fell out of those herbs, that garlic, the, the, the natural juices that have roasted in that bird, um, all of those are now in that pan, right? On that sheet tray or in that pan. We have to release those flavors. So that's a key piece that we're looking at. Hey, so a lot of people get nervous about chicken and overcooking chicken, or not overcooking, undercooking chicken. Yeah, absolutely. I'm one of those people. That's why I don't like chicken. The, uh, <laughs> the beauty about the beauty about a chicken is you can always put it back in the oven for a little bit. What was your temp just now? You I'm at 150, so I'm almost there. Okay. A couple more degrees. And that was like 10 minutes, right? Yeah, about five. Seven. Five to seven. All right. Um, the thing is, is don't bring it to the table until you're sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a good, it's probably a good comment, right? Yeah, right? There's nothing worse than me like, ta-da! And then it's like super raw and it's that, you know. No, it's not good. <laughs> I think you want to err on the side of safety here, right? Yeah, you want to err. So, so, you know, one of the things that we even talk about, um, uh, you can you can even get to the point where, you know, if, if you cut into that, that bird, right? You cut into that breast and you start to fillet it off of the top of, of that bone, um, and it's a little under. You can still put that back, put it in the oven just a few minutes to get it up to temperature, and then it will be part of the presentation when you come. Because when you come table side and get ready to carve, I actually prefer to have the breast ready um, to come off of that cavity a lot faster because then I'm able to just grab it and slice it for the guest. So it's a way that you can kind of work in there and you know look like a rock star without and if you're a weirdo, raw chicken. like me you can use chef mike <laughs> and not our chef at four that's awesome chef mike but i'm talking about the microwave <laughs> chef T mike T tina's a fan of uh the microwave sure. <laughs> if you're never if you're unsure not put that baby in the microwave for 30 seconds maybe one minute <laughs> you're gonna be fine so what, what we're gonna do is you know the lentils are right there i got a last little bit of liquid I got my carrots ready to go. All I gotta do is put a little bit of heat on them when I'm ready to serve them. The chicken is just about to the right temperature where I'm getting ready to pull it and let it rest on the plate, let it be good. Um, the last part that we're gonna do is we're gonna make the sauce. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna remove that bird from the pan and then we're gonna take that pan to the burner. We're gonna turn that heat on and we're gonna deglaze that pan with that white wine. That's gonna release all of that stuff on the bottom. That's where we're gonna be able to scrape all those good bits off and then add the chicken stock um, to the pot, add the drippings to the pot, and then thicken it with the cornstarch and get our gravy. So that's kind of where we're going with this next uh, this next piece of it. So you guys ready? All right, so I'm gonna pull that bird out. I'm gonna put it on a large plate just to rest. And now I've got this pan with all those drippings. That is the key to your sauce. If it's on a sheet tray, you're doing the same exact thing. You're gonna go straight to the burner. You're gonna want some type of spoon to be able to scrape all that up. So I'm gonna turn the heat on high at this point. Now that I've got my heat on high, I'm cooking off that last little bit of water that's on there because I'm not interested in the water that's, that's still on there. I'm more interested in the flavors um, that are happening underneath. So I'm gonna start with that white wine. Once I know this pan's got some heat to it, I know I can deglaze and it's gonna release so I think that's a key piece. So it's starting to talk a little bit. You know, I've got those carrot scraps still in there. And this is where it actually makes dishwashing a lot easier too. You know, throwing that sheet tray straight on, um, it's gonna heat up much quicker because it's a thinner metal. Go ahead and add your white wine to it. Mine's a cast iron, so it's gonna take a little bit more. But if you have a thinner pan, go ahead and add that and start scraping all those good bits off the bottom. So I'm gonna add mine. And I'm literally going to scrape that entire pan 
to get all those good bits off the box. This is what's going to make your gravy and your sauce pop. This is where all the flavor comes from. Once I can see that my entire bottom of my pan is nice and, and clear, there's nothing stuck to it, I'm grabbing that chicken stock and that's going in there. So that's a key piece for me right there, is making sure that we're, and I'll bring that to you guys. So at this point, I've got no, nothing stuck to the bottom, right? right? Even if you're using the sheet tray, um, once you've scraped all that on the sheet tray um, and you've added that, you can actually put that into a sauce pot. Um, that's another way, or a saute pan. It doesn't, you don't have to make it in the pan if you're feeling uncomfortable because it's so shallow. Um, it's okay. You're just helping me out with the dishes situation, right? Like yes. Dishes. Okay. <laughs> this is going to make your dishes much easier to clean up. And you can see uh, from that simple technique that we just did, um, it's already got the gravy color. And that's what you're looking for. You know, as far as the bird, you know, the bird's been cooking. So at this point now, we want it to stop cooking, right? We want it to rest and relax before we try to carve it. So, oh, just you know, like just like just like the steak class, we're, we're going through that same process. We're allowing the, the meat to rest before we start to try to, to carve into it. So I had to chase the dog down. You pulled the chicken, mm -hmm. your chicken tip. Yep. You grabbed the... You did it smart, right? So you pulled the chicken out, so all the yummy bits are on the bottom of that pan. Mm -hmm. And then what did you add there? Um, so I added the I added the the uh, white wine to deglaze. I added the um, I added the white wine to deglaze. I added the chicken stock to cook a little bit more. I'm gonna put this in the oven just to stay warm. Did you turn the oven off? No. Nope. You don't like the temp. Huh? Do you like the temp that got to or wasn't there yet? Uh, it's right there. I just want to make sure it carries over while we make the sauce. Okay. So if, if anybody's like you take it out and put it back in, it's okay if they do that too. Yeah, yeah. And that, and that's where we just, you have to trust the temp. Everyone's oven's different. So, you know, make sure you're temping that in the thickest parts because you're shooting for that 155 mark. So I'm reducing down this stock into uh, that white wine, all those drippings. Um, I'm turning my broil on for uh, color. Oh, we're, we're, we're doing we're, the blast. We're doing the blast. Okay, yes. we're doing the blast. Okay, so we're going to a broil. We're turning that heat up high because we want some color on there too. And you can smell this amazing aromatic happening. And that's like your chicken sauce, like this, the bits from the chicken that you cooked. Mm -hmm. And you put the carrot chops back in there? Yeah, I threw them for just a little bit of extra flavor because they were. I threw them in the oven. Oh, I love that. You missed that? I did. Chasing the dog. That's not hot to your mouth? It's not hot to my mm. mouth. Oh, it might be our in law. <laughs> oh, or the door's open. The wind is crazy. <laughs> That's so crazy out there, that wind. So at this point now, I've got that slurry. You remember that slurry we made? Um, as this is boiling, what we're going to do is we're going to take that slurry, make sure you stir it back up so it's nice and smooth. And we're going to add that into, with a whisk, we're going to add that into the gravy. Now don't add all of it at once, you can always thin it out. So if it gets a little thick on you, you can always add a little bit of water to it, thin it out. Did but yours get thick? A little bit, a little bit more than I wanted, just a tad bit. I'm going to add just like a tablespoon to thin mine out. And now you've got this gorgeous gravy. People want to know if you're keeping those carrot tops in there. No, I'm not keeping those carrot tops in there. Okay. Carrot tops are going to come out, guys. We're using we're using them for flavor just from the bottom of the chicken pan, right? Yeah. So you can scrape out your carrot tops if it's, you know, bugging you. <laughs> You do cook with like bay leaves though, and you leave those in a lot, right? <laughs> yep. Like because the flavor is so good. One of the things also um, I would say at this point as well is, uh, you know, you can use a strain strainer to, to strain it all out. Um, that would be another great way. I'm checking the broiler because that's hot. Woo. See where that temp's at? I'm flipping the pan around 
to make sure that it's getting all the heat. I don't want the heat just to hit one side of the bird, so I'm spinning the pan around to make sure it's getting all the sides of the bird. And you didn't use all of your uh, corn syrup powder. What was that again? I forgot. Cor uh, the slurry. The oh, yeah, slurry. Syrup. yeah, there's still about half of it still in there. And, and the thing about it is slurry is very powerful. It's going to thicken something up really quick. But you can see the consistency of my gravy now uh, is... Spoon holes. <laughs> you know, we call this uh, nappe, which means uh, to stick to the back of a spoon. Uh, that's the consistency in, in French. Um, so that's what we're shooting for. It's a really nice gravy. You've thrown out some terms tonight. Nappe, sticking to the back of the spoon. And earlier you said one, a cute, um, I couldn't tell, uh, to drain the water off. I don't know. You said a word. A sec. A sec. Which yeah. is to what? Uh, to, to cook to almost dry. Almost dry. Okay. That was for the lentils. Yep. So our lentils now, I'm tasting those. See where those are at. Like Julia, that is hot. The lentils are perfect for me. They're creamy. They've got a nice texture on the outside. They don't taste raw. They don't stick to my teeth. Um, that's what I'm looking for. There's barely any liquid left in there. I'm happy with where these lentils are. And the nice part is with black lentils, you can see they've got a almost caviar look to them. So they're really beautiful on a plate. Strip that on your neck. <laughs> Hey, so I'm checking the chicken right now, and I'm also turning the heat back onto the carrots just to get those ready because we're about to eat. What kind of heat? High on the carrots? They're gonna ask what heat on the carrots? Yeah, I turn on high just to get them hot. So my my chicken's getting some beautiful color on it. I'm making sure we don't burn it. I like what's happening. You can see it's getting some some nice, you know, air pockets, which means it's puffing up. It's drying. I'm gonna hit it just a few more spots before we go to serve it. But I'm feeling pretty good about that chicken right now. Somebody said those were sexy lentils. Tara. Sexy lentils. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it'd be labeled in the 50 Shades of Chicken book. <laughs> it might be labeled that way. <laughs> hey, so if you weren't doing lentils, which the lentils took a while to cook, right? Yeah, it took with about your, 30 minutes. Yeah, with your chicken, and you had other things like I don't know, salad or potatoes, or if you were interchanging things, uh -huh. would you just come start the chicken earlier? Absolutely. And then absolutely. wait 30 minutes and then come back? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. You know, and I, I think the important part when we're doing these classes is just showing you like how a dinner can all come together at once. I'm always impressed by that, honestly. So for the chicken, she freaks out because she thinks I know, it's hot. I thought you were going to hit me with the oil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. You can now take the string off the chicken. Just cut it off. No one can touch that. You can't fill your fingertips. You can use shears, kitchen shears. Most people who have a, a block uh, can use the scissors in it to do this. Or just use a knife. Oh, I stole those scissors. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and at this point, your chicken has had enough time to rest. Wait, do we consider being in the broiler, resting? For me, yeah, because at that point, I'm not really cooking. I'm just crisping that skin really quick. Okay. I mean, that was like three minutes of sure. getting it crispy on the outside. Um, but, you know, what's good about that. Wait, wait, let me show what you're doing. Yeah, no? Mm -hmm. Okay, hold on. There's a couple things you can All be right. looking for hold as on. well. Can you um, see it or no? If you don't have a thermometer, I think that's uh, something important for, for everyone. You know, your your bones are going to be exposed. That's one thing that you're looking for is, is the, the meat starts to separate from the bone, especially right here on these legs. That's an indicator that you're ready to go. Another thing you can be looking for is when you open up that leg and thigh, the joint's still connected. You're able to see inside that leg right there. Um, is it pink or not? So that's another thing that you're you're looking at it's as white. far as that. It looks white. Um, sure the same? Same thing on this side. You can see there's a small blood spot there. That's just the that's the joint where the where the the thigh bone connects to the to the leg bone. That always freaks me out. That freaks everyone out. So in the restaurant, we actually blast that uh, with either a torch or something if we're serving this this cut of meat, just to not freak people out. Um, the other thing I'm looking at is the juices. You know, the juices coming out right now. 
are, are nice and tender, or excuse me, are nice and clear. Um, so that's an indicator. You can look also um, underneath the bird or even uh, in that cavity that we were talking about. You know, you're going to see the pool that happens right there, um, that it's nice and, and clear. So that's another indicator of what we're looking at. Looks like a chicken laying eggs with a garlic cloves. <laughs> it does not look like chicken laying <laughs> eggs with the garlic cloves. <laughs> Um, so, um, that's, you know, kind of the core of the chicken. Um, you know, as far as, you know, putting all this stuff together, um, it looks beautiful when you put it together on a plate because, you know, you get you warmed up your carrots. these really pretty carrots that have all these gorgeous colors on Lucy, it. get out of there. Come on. And, you know, they're tender, they're glazed, they got a nice shine to them. There's purple and orange and white in there. Huh? Pull that plate towards you. Okay. Pretty please. Thank you. Yeah. Good? Yeah, right there. Right there. All right. So you've got these nicely glazed carrots. You always plate for one. <laughs> well, I plate family style. Okay, fa family style plating, guys. Lucy, get out of there. <laughs> I think Lucy is excited she about. She hopes you drop some chicken. She is. <laughs> Smart dog. Can you shut that cabinet? You're driving me crazy. Huh? Shut that cabinet. <laughs> You're driving me crazy. You've got your lentils, which have a great contrast. And I want to know if everybody likes the lentils because I was I was like, oh, we're gonna make what? Because <laughs> you put a lot of flavor into those. <laughs> And then you also have your bird, you know, and when you're carving up a bird, there's a couple of things, you know, you have what's called an eight way. So the breast, the leg, the thigh, the wing times two. So that would be eight ways, eight pieces of bird. Um, to carve your bird, there's a couple of things that you're going to look at. You have this, this breastplate right in the center. So if you cut into that, oh, wow. that breastplate right there. Hot. You can essentially remove that breast all the way through. Tina's freaking out. Well, I'm scared. I, you have a lot of wicked burns, dude. And then you have this leg and thigh. This thigh is connected right here in the hip. So if you actually grab that leg on, on this side of it and you pull it back, this hip joint, this thigh bone right here is going to pop out. So it popped right out of that thigh bone, uh, right out of that joint, and you're going to be able to remove that piece of the bird completely. That's so now you've got right? a leg and a thigh. You can see the seam right here between the leg and the thigh. So if you flip it over, you can see the bone runs up and cut right through the cartilage of the top of that knuckle of the, of the leg. So there's your leg. There's your thigh, there's your breast, and then you have your wing, which is simply just connected at that joint, and that would be your eight-way chicken. And then you can remove it on the other side. So, <laughs> his little another, head right another, there. Wing, <laughs> another wing, we're gonna remove the other breast. You do that so fast. I know you slowed down for the first part. And then no one should be freaked out of those little blood vessel things you said. No, right? these are just bones. Those are all just bones. You know, the meat's cooked through. We tempt it. But you even said in the restaurant, just because people are like, uh, yeah, people, them. people will always freak out. So, you know, if you want to put a little bit of extra heat on them just so they don't, you know, trip out. But bones and now, are... what if anybody is like starting to carve and they're like, well, I think this is going to cook a little longer? Just go ahead and throw it back in the oven? Yeah, I can always go back in the oven for a few. Even after you've separated it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So at this point now, we've got two thighs. We've got some breast meat. I'm trying to keep up with you on the camera. Can you see it in there? Yep. Okay. Sorry, it's crooked. I'm holding it with my left arm. Shaking and we've got bit. two of these legs. And we've got our wings. And you plated it uh, family style. Mm -hmm. And Joe and Michelle are on their way to play Catan and eat your chicken. Yeah. And don't forget, we've got that gorgeous gravy that we're just going to pour right on the top. Oh, yeah. I'll eat that. With that bird. I did leg day today. <laughs> so 
That's um, how we get to a roasted chicken with should we come back up? glazed carrots and black lentils. Now we got time to enjoy dinner. Wow. Yeah. How's everybody feeling? That was a long one. Hour 50 minutes. <laughs> chicken takes a while. You got to make sure it's done, right? Yeah, I mean, you want to make sure your chicken's done. And, you know, I, I think that's a key piece. But I, I wanted to give a lot of information for yeah. tonight's class because you gave so many. I think it's Skills. important to kind of understand the, the pieces behind everything. There's so many things that are happening um, sweating, chef, huh? when it comes to that, you know. Um, but, yeah, I mean, this applies to, to Thanksgiving and, you know, it, it applies to roasting a chicken or roasting a duck. I mean, it, should make you feel a little bit more comfortable when you're roasting a whole animal. I think that's a, a key piece, but, you know, caramelizing vegetables, simmering grains, simmering beans, um, legumes, like that's another, another technique that's going to add into it. But and a legume you know. discussion happened because I'm tracking my macros and I have to eat so much protein, uh -huh. fat and carbs. And <laughs> Yeah, this is actually a, a great source of protein between the, the lentils and the chicken. Um, it works out really well on both of that. But I think our family has just realized that they can show dinner's up ready, so they're showing up. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you hear the dogs. But yeah, they, any questions? Um, I hope I hope your uh, your uh, your chicken came out. Um, yeah, mine mine looks extremely juicy too, uh, just because you know we roasted it properly. And uh, the lentils are cooked nice. The carrots look glazed right. Uh, the gravy came out. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I love being able to, to cook with you all and, you know, have some fun with it. So I know it was tough today with the restaurant uh, in power. So yeah. we just thank you, everybody who had to have a cancellation tonight. Yeah, I, I totally forgot about that until she just reminded I'm sorry. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, being an owner, right? You got to pivot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Part, part of owning a restaurant, you know, comes with the territory. But, you know, we appreciate doing these classes with you all. This is so much for us. Um, you know, we, we have a blast. I think we're going to be switching these up probably to like Thursdays. Yeah, Thursdays um, at 6 maybe. Just because, you know, I, I, I like to be at the restaurants as well on Saturday. Um, and, uh, yeah, stay tuned because we're going to be doing some more stuff. We'll probably take next week off just to kind of gather our <laughs> – our thoughts and then put together some more classes, but yeah, we've been having fun with it. So oh, Monica said you should do a whole uh, fish. Ooh, ooh, that would be fun. Yeah, Tina's an eater, so. I, well, I might. Yeah, I'm not gonna eat it. Probably. <laughs> Don't be judgy on me. <laughs> I would love to do a whole whole thing on on fish. I, I I think that'd be fun. Maybe like a salt baked fish. You know, we'll do it in a salt crust. Yeah, she was saying like cool. she, she would pause Gordon Ramsay to watch mm. this class tonight, <laughs> and I was wondering if you thought a whole roasted mm. fish would be good. Uh, when does the Food Network show come out? <laughs> uh, hey, we wish, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, TV is always fun, but, you know, I, I think in today's day and age, I'd, I I'm actually enjoy doing this on our own because we don't have to deal with the producers telling us what to do. And Hey, I'm telling you what to do right you now. Are, yeah, I, you're the only producer he never that listens. I actually listen to. <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody said, they, oh, oh, let's see, Andre? I, I said hi to you at Costco yesterday. I didn't mean to sneak up on you and freak you out. <laughs> oh, man. I It, it happens. It ha These masks are so hard because people are saying hi to you, and you're like, who are you? I can't, you can't see, see anybody's you. face. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, three weeks ago, we started talking about doing a class with Steve, Steve our sommelier. Uh -huh. And now they're saying, like, hey, people are asking what wine would pair instead of the Paloma. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about doing, like, a wine pairing? I, I would love to. The problem is, is getting Steve to not work. <laughs> he's, he's at the restaurant. Normally. Giving, giving wine lessons to people there. But maybe if we move to Thursday. Yeah, that I think that'll work out really well. I think for them, really well. I think for our, our uh, people who are cooking with us to see how you and Steve approach like tasting Ooh, food yeah. and then tasting wine. Because mm -hmm. you guys are like, that's a super freak thing. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I don't, you're like, oh, I taste lemon and zest and all that. I'm like, what? Yeah, we, I taste we love tasting wine. And I think that you're right. That would be a great. Yeah. experience for people it would, it would probably change the price point a little bit to give wine <laughs> pairings but we could probably figure that out for like yeah. people who are interested yeah we, we've got a couple of wineries that have reached out um so hopefully we can get uh paul hobbs uh involved in that because i know they've they've expressed you know wanting to do some wine pairings for everybody so 
And then what pans did you use at the beginning? Some people said, hey, tell me what you were using. You like cast iron. I love cast iron. Uh, I have some uh, an, uh, Anilon pans that I, I'm using. Uh, I think most of our set is Anilon. And we um, have cast iron that we've had for over 20 years, you and I. Yeah, yeah we, we've inherited some cast iron yeah. from family members. It's an investment, but man, it lasts forever. It lasts forever. As long as you take care of it, season it. Um, you know, don't, don't dry it out with water on it. So it rusts. Never put it in the dishwasher. Never put I it in the dishwasher. I learned that the hardest way. I'm sorry Never. about that, chef. <laughs> but you can always re-season it, which is, which is nice. <laughs> um, plus they're good for camping. I, I love taking the cast iron out when we go camping. And then for that lentil pan, like what did you, what, what pot is that? That's just sauce um, pot? Yeah, that's just a sauce pot. I believe that's a KitchenAid pot. I used to work for, um, with, uh, Whirlpool, Whirlpool who owns KitchenAid. So. I ended up with a lot of KitchenAid stuff uh, during that time. So Very shout cool. out to KitchenAid. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, would you mind to let's say, hey, have you guys considered doing paid sponsors? Hey, we should talk, Samantha. Who wants to pay to sponsor this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, kind of kind of playing around with these. I, it's really opened up the discussion that I think we could we could do our own show. Um, we could produce it and, you know, we could put something together. But I just, I love teaching. You know, I, I think it's it's fun to share my knowledge because someone, someone taught me. Um, so when I know this class was like a little bit longer, but like, I think the techniques that you shared are things that they, people could take away from ever if they remember mm -hmm. this, like yeah. when you're talking about caramelization, mm -hmm. you talk about how to build a sauce, right? Like, yeah. I mean, that's some big, some big things. Yeah. It makes it fun. Mirepoix. Everybody knows Mirepoix. now. Everyone knows Mirepoix. <laughs> well, don't let your food get cold. Uh, go enjoy your food. Thanks for joining us. I hope you all have a, a, a beautiful, amazing week. Um, and thanks for coming out with us for another uh, cooking class tonight. So um, stay safe, be healthy, and uh, we will see you on the next class. Peace Bye out. Guys. <laughs>